Young man going to West Point. I did 22 years in the Air Force. So I am really looking forward to what God's going to do through your life. So I heard the Spirit saying, persevere. It will not be easy. But if you will passionately pursue the purpose that God has for you, you will possess it. In Jesus' name. Would you stand for a minute? We want to worship the Lord. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, gee. Father, we thank you for this time that we stand in your presence. And Lord, we're blessed today because you, are good. All things work together for the good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so we thank you that it was your goodness that reached down into our lives and blessed us with a new life. It was your goodness that you showed to Moses when he asked to see your glory. And so whenever we experience your goodness, we're experiencing your glory and so your word exhorts us to arise and shine for your light has come prophetically Isaiah spoke those words into our lives arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us and so father we bless you this day that you have imparted unto us your goodness which is your glory. Now have your way in our service today, and we will give you all the praise. In fact, we give you praise in advance for what you're about to do today. Somebody say in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Let's give God a round of applause. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whoa. You are Father, we bless you, and now would everyone be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. Turning your Bibles, if you will, to Joshua, the second chapter. Joshua, the second chapter. And turn to your neighbor as you get there. When you get to Joshua, the second chapter, would you turn to your neighbor, put your hands on their shoulder, and say, expect the boomerang. Now, somebody might say, what in the world is a boomerang? Can I get any help from those of us that are born in the early 50s and uh, maybe just a little bit earlier than that? <laughs> what do they call us? I forget. But what do we, what do we call old. baby boomers? You said old. <laughs> baby boomers. Amen. So I'm going to talk to you about the boomerang. I want you to recognize that we do really serve a good God. And what God wants us to get out of this message today is that whatever good you do to others, it will boomerang back to you. It will come back to you. And we're going to look at a story that I believe is going to give you some new insights. You probably read the story before in Joshua, the second chapter, and you probably read all the way through that part. And you know exactly what happened. But I believe that God will give you today some new insights on what he wants to do in our lives. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. God wants us to have a blessed life. As a matter of fact, he is still in the blessing business. He's still in the miracle working business. He's still turning lives around. And, and when you look at this story today, you're going to see a person who gets their life truly turned around and given a new destination for where they're headed and, and giving them a new destiny because God is in the business of turning our lives around for his glory, for his glory. Let's pick it up, if we will, in this scripture. Joshua, the second chapter, starting with verse 8. 
Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof. Now, we say, well, who is they? So let me just take a minute to lay the background for those of you that may not know all of the details of the story. Joshua and the Israelites were now headed to the promised land. Moses had been their deliverer. He had brought them out of Egypt, and he had taken them through the wilderness journey, but now they were ready to cross over into the promised land. Tell your neighbor you're about to cross over into your promised land. God has plans for our lives. God has a purpose for our life. God has a destiny for our lives that sometimes we don't even know. We don't even have any kind of way of understanding all that God wants to do in your life. You might start one way, but you're going to finish a different way. Amen? So it's not where you start, it's where you finish. And so as he was bringing those people, now that Joshua had been now put in command, he was encouraged to be strong and courageous. Men, be strong and courageous. So you will bring your people, your families, into their inheritance, into the promised land. And so as he was encouraging them to do so, Joshua would have been for 40 years a warrior. He was a fighter. When Moses was praying, Joshua was in the valley fighting. That's what he does. He was a fighter. And so naturally, like David, as he came to this stronghold of Jericho, he was trying to prepare a strategy to how he would defeat, destroy, pull down the stronghold so they could possess the land. But what happened? Listen, he had to have some help. And so not only did he look to God, but he also, being a good strategist, he sent out some spies. Those spies were sent out to spy out the land. So they slipped into Jericho. And they were supposed to be there checking this out, checking this out, see if they could find some weak links or some ways that we could sneak in here and destroy them. And that's why we pick it up in this story. In verse 8, they were now looking to a woman to give them some assistance because the king found out they were there. And as they lay down up in the upper roof, she came up to them on the roof. This woman, her name is Rahab. And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Wow. That the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. Wow, wow you got to think about this. This is not an Israelite speaking. This is a woman who heard what God had did for the Israelites, and now she is prophetically declaring and speaking life into her own life without even realizing it. First, she acknowledges that he is the God of the heavens above and the earth beneath. That means that God reigns not only in heaven, but he reigns on the earth. Amen? God reigns, and we sang that song this morning, that God reigns. No matter what difficulties we may be facing, no matter what challenges we are enduring right at this particular moment, one of the things that we must keep in our heart, our God reigns. He's still on the mountaintop. He's still ruling in the affairs of men. And that's why we can stand on Romans 8, 28 and declare all things. Somebody say all things. All things work together for the good because we love God. Do you love God this morning? If you love God, know this. No matter what you're dealing with today, what you're dealing with today, you're not going to deal with in the future. I remember when Moses told those people, when they were at the Red Sea, standing before the Red Sea, wondering, how are we going to cross over? And Pharaoh was bearing down on them. And then what did Moses say to them? He said, listen, don't worry. The enemy you are facing today, you will see no more because God will fight for you. There are some things we don't have to fight for. There are some things that we just need to stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because he will work it out for our good. Here she is prophetically declaring, for not only is he the God in heaven and on earth, 
But I say to you that he is the Lord your God. Now, therefore, in verse 12, she says, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I've shown you kindness. Somebody say kindness. What she did was she hid them. When they heard that the enemy was coming down on them and that the king had found out that they were there, uh, they went to this prostitute's house. Her name was Rahab. And sought shelter. And they wanted to be hidden. So she took them up on her roof, covered them up, and then she says these words to them. I want you to show kindness. Somebody say kindness. To my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of us ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for a house was on the city wall, and she dwelt on the wall. And so she said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned, and afterwards you may go your way. My operational verse, Joshua 2.14. Let's take a look at it again and read it. So the men answered her, our lives for yours. Our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Our lives for yours. Rahab, through a risky act of faith, because shortly after that, of course, you know, she had to lie. <laughs> the king came while they were hiding on the roof, and she had to lie and said, no, I haven't seen. Matter of fact, I think they went this way. But she knew that they were up there on the roof, and she was going to secretly let them out. She had to risk her life in order to save their lives. Beloved, acts of kindness will boomerang back to you. Acts of kindness will bless your life. What the world needs now is not more hatred, judgment, condemnation. What the world needs now is more love provoked kindness. Kindness that is about changing the situation and blessing somebody else besides ourselves. One act of kindness, beloved, can be a game changer. And before you say, what in the, where is he going with this? Let me say this. Hang on. I am going somewhere with this, okay? I am going somewhere with this, but it's important for us to lay the proper foundation. One act of kindness can be a game changer. Somebody say game changer. A game changer, let me give you a definition for a game changer. A game changer is someone who despite the odds and despite the things that are aligned against them, if you will, the odds, the expected outcome, because there was an expected outcome, steps up, motivated by a cause, motivated by a cause, and turns the tide in their favor. A game changer. See, a game changer, to me, they are the true heroes and heroines in our lives today. People who don't just settle for what hand they've been dealt. They, listen, they do like the real card sharks do. They say, listen, let me turn these in for another hand. God has given you a better hand through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, we've been dealt a certain hand, but listen, as I said earlier, it's not where you start. It's not the hand that has been dealt to you or the predictions of others that they speak over your life. You've got to recognize this was a prostitute. She was a harlot. Life had not treated her well, and she had to reduce herself to something that was actually immoral in order to survive in the realm that she was in. But God, but God had showed up. He showed up in an unexpected way through some spies, and he was about to turn her life around. But she had to do something. She had to demonstrate some faith. She had to act and risk something in order to gain something. And so as she took that step of faith and put that faith in the Lord God, who was the God of heaven and earth, 
whom she knew that the people that she lived with and then dwelled within that city of Jericho was already fearful of. They were expecting the enemy to come and destroy them. And she made a, change, a decision. I am going to risk my life for my family. Not just my mother and father, but for my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, I'm going to risk everything. Somebody say, she had a cause. Brian Houston, who, who was the leader, if you will, he's the apostolic leader now. He was the pastor of those who were involved with Hillsong in Australia. He had this to say in a book that he had, which I really thought was really nice. And so I thought I would just pass this on to you. See, if you do not know the meaning for your life, you will never live a life of meaning. See, we've got to have a reason for our existence. We've got to have something greater than ourselves that we are choosing to make a risk to do whatever we need to do in order to bless someone else. I remember David. Do you remember David and his battle with Goliath? Well, when he showed up on the scene as that 17-year-old boy, you know, his, his brothers who were older than him, they mocked him. Hey, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be doing that. And so here's one of the things that I was really impressed by. David says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? You see, he had meaning for living. He said, I'm not going to allow this, this Goliath, this giant to, listen, <clears throat> to talk about my God like this to insult my God? He said, there's a cause here. I'm going to stand up. Here he was, but 17 years old. Here he was with a little run of a man. And look, look, look. And as a matter of fact, there was a huge giant before him who was trained for war. And he said, listen, I don't need, I don't need a sword or a javelin. I have God, the same God that helped me defeat the lion and the bear is going to help me to take your head off. You know, if I was Goliath and somebody said something like that to me and he, all he had was a slingshot and a, and a couple of rocks, I think I would say either he is crazy, and if so, I need to avoid him, or he knows something I don't know. Either way, I need to say, okay, uh, I'll see you another day. But no, he stood up against not David, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. See, the battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. Hallelujah. We need to know that. If the Lord be for you, who can be against you? Come on. You need to know this. See, the handwriting on the wall for your life can be turned around by one act of faith giving kindness to another. Because that pleases God. And when God is pleased, he will move on your behalf. Did you know that we are called to be peculiar? We're not supposed to be like the world. Hmm? You hear all the stuff on the television. We hear about this challenge and that challenge and hatred moving all around. See, the enemy is on his game. He's the God of this world. And the world system wants to Listen, it wants to actually confuse us to keep us from not recognizing who we really are. We are children of the Most High God. Listen, if the only God or Jesus people will see on the earth is the Jesus they see in you and I. Okay? That's the only Jesus they're going to see. And so when we start to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth realm, and become a light, come on, to the world, then listen, people are going to see our good deeds and do what? Bring glory to our Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. And then God is going to bless our lives. You see, a cause gives you a sense of purpose and direction. A cause gives you a meaning for living. Having a cause is the most important factor in becoming what you are not, and that is a game changer. You see, she cared about her family. Joshua 2, 12, this is what she says. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also show kindness to my father's house. Give me a token. Spare my father, my mother, my brother, my sister, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. 
This is what Rahab did. She lived a life of meaning, and because she took the risks of faith and showed kindness to these spies, it changed her family's destiny, and she also had her life change. See, Rahab, if some of you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew, the first chapter, you're going to find out that Rahab, who was a prostitute, suddenly was transformed. She was actually delivered. When she demonstrated kindness towards these spies, the Lord brought the boomerang of kindness back to her. She took a chance. She risked her life. She, listen, if you will, she sold out to God. Are you sold out? Hmm? Are you sold out lock, stock, and barrel? Are you fully committed to the cause of Christ in the earth realm? Because that's what she became. Jesus had a cause. He wanted to bring his people into the promised land. That's what God was trying to do. The stronghold was there before them. The victory came not because of the strategy of, David, of uh, Joshua. The strategy of Joshua to spy out the land wasn't even necessary because God had another plan. He was going to tear down this stronghold not through a man's strategy. He's going to tear down this stronghold with praise. He had a strange strategy. I want you to walk around this stronghold for seven days. And on the seventh day, seven being the number of completion, I want you to shout and blow the trumpet in Zion. Hallelujah. And when that happened, the walls, they did listen, they have excavated that area and the walls are still intact underground. That's what happened. The earth opened up. The walls just dropped. And those, those listen, those un, <laughs> unexpected civilians and people in, the, in Jericho, they weren't even ready when Joshua and the people just swept across because the walls that they were hiding behind. See, your enemy doesn't know who you are. Come on, somebody. He, he doesn't know who he's messing with. He's messing with a child of God. And, and just when he least suspected, his defense system is about to collapse in front of him, and you're about to go in there and reap the spoils because that's what they did. So then, question, let me, let me ask you, Judy. Judy and I go back to Evangel Assembly back in the 80s. Amen. Oh, yeah. She saw our name out there, and she decided to come and sit in on your service today because we're here Thank you, Judy, for being here. But listen, if God already had a strategy, why did Joshua send the spies? Why did he allow Joshua to send the spies? Why, why was he inspired by God to send these spies in there to spy out the land when God already had a plan? You know why he was sent? Say it again. You're absolutely right. I need you to hear that. Though this is no coincidence, there was only one person who had faith in God in Jericho. It was Rahab. It wasn't her mother or her father. Come on. It wasn't her cousins. Come on. It wasn't her nieces and nephews. It was just Rahab. If you're the only one in your family that believes in God, you're enough to save the entire family. You need to hear that today. Because, and you need to hear the second thing. God will send somebody just for you because of your faith. He sent those spies in there not to really spy out the land. They didn't get a chance to spy out the land. The king found out. They were hiding, and then they escaped. You know why they were sent there? They were sent because God was concerned about one person. And God want me to tell you today, he's concerned about you. You need to know that. It doesn't matter what you're facing today. God is concerned about you. You as an individual. The most important person that God is concerned about today is little old you. 
We serve an amazing God. It's amazing who he is. Do you realize that all over the world, in the United States of America, at this time or shortly around this time, everybody is waiting on an expectation of God to show up in their lives, minister to them in a sermon. Come on. They came not to hear a man. They came to hear God. They didn't come to hear a woman. They came to experience God. They came to get an encouraging word from God today. And here's the word that God wants you to say. If there was nobody else in this world, I would come for you. And I am a deliverer. Come on. I will deliver you, and I have delivered you, and I will continue to deliver you. Because just like this one sister that came forward this morning, I don't know where she is now, but she had a, a, a shirt on the front, and on the back it said God was going to rapture us. And so I want you to know something. We are going to be raptured. We are going to be out, taken out of here. you got to think about this. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just like he delivered Rahab before he destroyed that city of Jericho. He didn't, he just, didn't he deliver Lot and his family before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? Didn't he deliver Moses, I mean Noah, before he allowed the flood to come? Noah and his children and listen, all of their wives, come on, he delivered them. Well, what you talking about? I don't care what these people talk about. We're going to be mid-tribulation rapture or we're going to be post-tribulation rapture. I'm not going through. My faith is like Rahab. I'm expecting God to deliver me before he comes in to destroy this earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm getting up out of here. Come on. <laughs> Some people try to take an airplane ride, but I'm going to take a plane air ride. Come on. I'm getting up. Matter of fact, I got a rapture roof in my car. Come on. <laughs> let, that, that, let that window back out of that roof, and I'm just going straight on up. Amen? Amen? Because, listen, he tells us in his word that we're going to meet him in the air. And those who die before us are going to join us. They, in fact, they're going to precede us, and then we're going to meet them in the air. And listen, you're talking about a reunion? Yeah. Glory to God. I'm going to see my mother and my father, my uncles that have all went before me. Come on, they believed in Jesus. We're going to get up out of here. Deliverance is yours. Deliverance is available to all of us who just believe. You may not see it, don't know how he's going to work it out, but God will deliver you. Rahab couldn't see it had no way of knowing how things was going to work out. She knew that she had a life of prostitution. It was her only means of income. But see, God doesn't look at our faults. He looks at our heart. Oh, glory to God. He looks beyond our faults, and he looks at our heart. He knew her heart was, I don't want to be doing this. This is the only means I have for living. So he turned her life around, and her life was transformed from being a prostitute to becoming a part of the tribe of Israel. Yes, she did, because she was the only one rescued. Where was she going to go? It was just her and her family. The rest of Jericho was totally destroyed. And then here she is left. So she just hung in with the Israelites, ended up marrying one of them, excuse me. And then guess what? She became the great, great grandmother of David, who became king. And she became the ancestor of Jesus Christ because she married into the tribe of Judah. Well, what was that tribe of Judah? Remember what Judah means. See, that girl back there knows her Bible, I tell you. She's with me all the way in praise. See, she, listen. If you get delivered, my friend, out of a situation where everybody you know is destroyed, I'm telling you, you're going to jump up and click your heels in the air and shout, Hallelujah! <laughs> Even before the rest of the stuff unfolded, she was praising God. You better believe she began to praise God. When them spies showed up and Joshua told them, make sure you go by that house and get her. God wants me to tell somebody today, God will never forget your labor of love that you've shown towards people and are still showing. He will never forget. He is not going to forget what we've done. He didn't forget Rahab. When they came back, 
to attack that city, what happened? Joshua said to the spies, go get her. And she had left a little, there was a little scarlet scarf was supposed to be set out there so they'd know that house. And they went and got her and took her and her family out and then destroyed everything else. God delivered her. God transformed her into a holy woman. Come on. Was a prostitute. She became a holy woman. God turned her life around. She married into the tribe of Judah and became the great, great grandmother of King David. Hallelujah. And it's all right there in Matthew, the first chapter. If you haven't turned there, I ask you to turn there. Matthew, the first chapter, verse 5. That's where it starts. It starts to outline who she is. She is a changed woman, all because she sowed a seed of kindness. Did you hear that? She sowed a king, a seed of kindness. So, all of that was my introduction. I know this is my first time speaking in front of you all, but <laughs> I, I have long introductions, and, and, and my messages are usually pretty short, so there's hope. Amen, there's hope. We can still make it out of here before. What time y'all close, by the way? 12 o'clock, is it? Do y'all normally get out at 12? Okay, I'm going to shoot for 12, amen? Now, if I miss it, don't worry about it. We'll be all right, amen? So buckle up your seatbelts, come on, because we're going to ascend to greater heights right now. And it might be a little turbulence along the way, but don't worry, we're going to make it to our destination, all right? So here's my observation from the passage. So do we, I only have three points, okay? Long introductions, but only three points. Number one, write this down. Kindness is not based upon whether the recipient is worthy or not. You see, God is not a respecter of persons. God is only a respecter of faith. For without faith, Hebrew eleven six says, it's impossible to please him. But they that come unto him must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. Somebody say rewarder of those who diligently seek him. She sought him, and God rewarded her. So Rahab was a harlot, but God looked beyond her faults and saw her faith and saved her. So the psalmist declares this, because Jesus, through his kindness, destroyed the sentence of death upon our lives, and he gave his lives for ours as a living donor. You see, the boomerang came back to, har to this harlot, Rahab, because she became a living donor. You see, a living donor is someone who sacrifices their life for, some, for a greater good. Amen? For a greater good. And, and can I speak to you plainly for a minute? Our challenges in this world is that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in the earth realm. Spirits. The Bible says spiritual hosts of wickedness. You see, see, Satan wants to influence us to propagate and promote his kingdom agenda. But God wants to influence us to propagate and promote his kingdom agenda. And so we're torn between two groups. Come on. Can I give me about four men right now? Four men. Don't jump all at once, but four men. Amen. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Make it six. Let's make it six. I like that number. We got, I see three. I need one more man. One more man. Okay, the young man coming who's going to the military. That's a good man to come. Amen. Who's going to West Point. I pray y'all pray for him. Amen. Now look, look. On one side, on my left. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's the God of this world. Okay. And all of his demonic <laughs> and spiritual wicked host of wickedness. Amen. Don't clap for them. I want y'all to take hands with each other. Uh, well, matter of fact, let's do it this way. I'm going to have all of y'all grab this hand in just a minute. Okay. Each of you grab some part of this arm. On this side, matter of fact, isn't it wonderful? How they organized because they, we didn't rehearse this, did we? No? So 
tell me as you're looking at them, which of them seem to be more formidable? Which group seems to be stronger? Bigger. Bigger, yeah, bigger. Bigger, that group. Did you know that when Satan slipped out of heaven, he took one-third of the angels with him, but two-thirds was on God's side. So that's why the Bible says there's more for us than is against us. You need to know that. As a matter of fact, you come on and join them up there. I want more on my side. Amen. Come on, join those guys over there. <laughs> Who's on the Lord's side? Amen. We're on the Lord's side. So here we are, little believer, the little believer in the middle, and here's what you need to understand. Every day, almost most of the part of the day, there are spiritual influences coming against you. That's why God tells us, take captive your thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. Even though you're carnal, the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to pulling down strongholds and bringing every thought. That's how the enemy operates. You have to watch out for the television and other things that the enemy uses, movies and whatnot, to influence us because he is the God of this world and the world system belongs to him. The only ones that get separated from him are the ones who have made Jesus Christ their Lord. Men, grab me. There, listen, one of the most powerful books I ever read was a book called by Peretti called This Present Darkness. Come on. If you have never read it, you need to get it. Now, I know that it's a fictional book, but let me tell you something. The revelations that come in that book about the demons that are latched onto you that you can't see or even experience or know that they're there, but they're latched onto you just like this group of guys right here, <laughs> the host of wickedness. <laughs> they're, they're pulling me, trying to get me to lean to their direction. But then I got over here on the other side, my right side. Come on, you guys, come on, take my arm. Everyone, you get some spot on here. Amen? Come now, on, remember, on. listen, guys. Y'all going to lose, okay? <laughs> They're pulling me this way, but Jesus and his team are pulling me the other way. And guess what? What makes the difference? I want y'all to all pull. I'm going to stay equal right here. What makes the difference is where I lean. To whom you yield yourself to, to that person, you become their power person. You become their slave, the Bible says. That's Romans 6. You become the slave of whom you, lead, you yield yourself to. Because you see, neither one of them can make you do anything you don't want to do. You have to yield to one or the other. You can yield to the wicked ones, or you can yield. See, Rahab for a long time was going this direction. But God, because she gave an act of kindness that went this way, God delivered her completely from the forces of darkness. She was on the other side. Somebody say, I'm crossing over. Somebody say, I'm crossing over. Tell your neighbor, I'm crossing over to the other side. Give them a round of applause. Amen. God loves us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. See, and my second point is this. God desires the spirit of kindness to be active in all of his children. And I'm going to give you scriptures for that. So write these scriptures down. You may not have time to turn to them. Proverbs 19.22. God says in Proverbs 19.22, what is desired in a man or in mankind is kindness. And then God models it before us. Isaiah 54.8 says, with a little wrath, God says, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Isaiah 54, 10 says, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness 
shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, said the Lord, who has mercy on you. We thank God for his mercy because his mercy is new every morning. But his loving kindness to those of you that are watching by live stream today, you need to know that the loving kindness of God is everlasting. It's everlasting. His, his loving kindness becomes the catalyst for his mercy. And his mercy is not getting what you deserve. You may deserve something else. She certainly deserves something else as a prostitute in the land. But God reversed it and turned her life around, delivered her from a life of wickedness and brought her into his saving grace and then given her a new lease on life so that she could live forever as a holy woman of God and gave her a new destiny to become an ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, Secondly, God encourages us. He not only models it, but he encourages us, put on kindness. It's almost like the arm of God. It says, put on the arm of God. Nowhere in the Bible where God tells you to put on something does he come back and say, take it off. When you put on the arm of God, you should keep that armor on because this world is wicked. And that's how you fought off the divorces of the darkness that's in the world. But he tells us, Put on kindness. In Colossians 3.12, he says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. In Romans 12.10, he says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. And then he provides it by his spirit. So we, we, he's going to give it to us. He wants us to model it just as he models it for us. And he gives us the resources that we always would have as we choose whom we lean to, as we choose to be influenced by the spirit and not the lust of our flesh and desires of our flesh. We choose to walk in the spirit. Hallelujah. Because the spirit and the flesh are warring against one another, but I make a choice just like Rahab did. She said, I'm putting that life behind me. I'm pressing on to the mark the high mark of God that's in Christ Jesus. Because I'm going up. Come on. Everything else that I've done in my past is in my past. And anything that you dig up from your past surely stinks. So let's not dig it up. Let's just live in the present and get ready for your future. You can expect the boomerang. Hey, He's going to provide it by his spirit. Galatians 5.22 says, For the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And then God urges us to grow in the grace of kindness. In 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, he says, But also for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue. See, once you start this race with God, you've got to have discipline and diligence to possess what God has for you. She had to be disciplined and she had to be diligent. She had to be disciplined enough that when they threatened to take her life, she said, Oh, no, they're gone. They left here a long time ago. They were all up in the roof. She had to risk her life, and you have to be diligent. She had to wait until her salvation came. Come on. you got to wait. You see, some people think that once saved, always saved. No, no. You can blot your name out of the book of life by your actions. The devil is a lie when he tells us we don't have to do anything. Once saved, always saved. No. She had to wait and be diligent, waiting on the Lord to come to deliver her from that lifestyle that she was in. She had no idea what God had in mind for her life. She thought, just save my family. But God's had more in plan for her. See, God don't deliver you. He also blesses you. Amen. He's got a new life for us. Hallelujah. It's a glorious life. You see, beloved, I believe Oh, listen, we can reach our family and our friends and our co-workers and our community easier with honey than with vinegar. Pastor, what do you mean? I'm glad you asked. See, we need to judge less and show more kindness. We need to criticize less and show more kindness. We need to condemn less and through love show more acts of kindness because God is expecting us to be different. Come on. It's easy to walk by sight and see things wrong with people. and see. But aren't you glad that God didn't walk by sight when he dealt with us? He walked by faith. We weren't measuring up to his standard. But listen, he didn't see us. He saw Jesus. 
And the blood of Jesus covered us and so that he could see beyond where we were to where he was bringing us to be. And aren't you glad that he did that, huh? That's what his mercy did because his loving kindness is better than life. Amen? And lastly, kindness will be rewarded. Kindness, when sown, will be rewarded. Let me say it again. Kindness, when sown, will be rewarded. Galatians 6. Galatians 6, verse 7 says, Whatever, whatever you sow, you shall reap. Hello? And verse 9 says, Do not become weary with doing good to others. Huh? Because in due season, in due season, tell your neighbor, this is your due season. Tell them, tell them, this is your due season. So that's why I said, my subject was, expect the boomerang. The kindness you've shown is coming back to you. The kindness Rahab shown to those spies came back to her. It did come back. God did not forget. God will not forget your labor of love and showing kindness and blessing others. See, the seed you sow, whether it be money, whether it be time, whether it be your treasure, your talent, whatever you do to advance God's kingdom in the earth realm is coming back to you. And you always reap more than you sowed. Because listen to this. There's a lady here with two children. I want you to stand to your feet right now. You're here in the midst right now. You have two children. Stand up, whoever you are. Two children. You got two children? Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Y'all were slow getting up, but y'all did get up. So I want you to bless your, your children or your grandchildren, whoever they are. And I want you to bless your children and your, your grandchildren. Okay, here. And you, you really deserve double. You've been hitting those scriptures left and right. You've been right there. You must have been, you must have been reading my sermon. God spoke to you. And, but, but hear this. The seed left my hands, right? But the seed you sow may leave your hand, but it never leaves your life. It will come back. It will come back to you. I'm, my wife tells me I'm generous to a fault. I am so generous. <laughs> because let me, let me tell you something. That money I just gave away, I put on a pair of pants yesterday that was in my closet hanging up, and it had all that money in it. Amen. I don't even know where it was. I, didn't, I don't know when the last time I wore those pants, Okay. <laughs> and I was and I reached out in my pocket and said, Whoa, well, where does money come from? You know what? Here's what God says. Give it away. You didn't even know you had it anyway. Just give it away. You weren't counting on it, you just give it away. Just give it away. Because the seed you sow leaves your hand, but never leaves your life. Be kind to others. I want to tell you a personal story. Because this message is really about my life and my wife's life. God has been so good to us. Matter of fact, when I do it, I say, so good. Because he's been so good. And remember, he's not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. Rehab by faith sowed an act of kindness, and it came back to bless her life. So, in 2016, I had to step down from my ministry that I had been pastoring for actually 
It's more than 20 some years because we planted the city, the church in D.C. It's Glad Titans Assembly, and then we merged with a church three years later. It became New Life Worship Center. I had to step down from it. And the reason I had to step down because my kidneys failed. And the handwriting was on the wall. See, my dad had kidney disease, and he was on dialysis for 20 years. And I, I saw him lose the quality of life. Jackie and I worked very hard, 22 years in the military, over 20-some years in ministry. And we wanted to retire and travel the world. But I knew that if I allowed my kidneys to fail and to die that I would be on dialysis like my dad and lose the quality of life. Somebody said, but God. I turned like Hezekiah to the wall. Hallelujah. And I, I cried out to God. And then I went and told my nephrologist, I'm not going on dialysis. She said, well, we got to put a shunt. You're, you're at 12%. You drop below 12%. Your kidney is going to stop working. And you need to get a shunt because to put this shunt in your arm, it takes three months to mature. And that's the best way to do dialysis with this kind of shunt. I said, I'm not doing it. She had a problem with me. <laughs> but I had a God that I could put my trust in. Now, this doesn't work for everybody because God deals with us uniquely different. But I know this, he will reward our faith. And so I said, I'm believing God for a living donor. Who would have thought when I put the word out and the people from the church got tested, none of them matched. My family got tested, none of them matched. Except a girl that 28 years before we had adopted. She wasn't even a family relationship. It wasn't my blood, but God. My wife and I became foster parents. And when we heard about two girls that they were born to crack addict mothers who in Washington, D.C., deserted them at the hospital. We took the, because of my medical background, they brought them into our homes. They came on heart monitors. They also expected developmental difficulties. But we prayed. We took them in. We decided to adopt them. Made them our own. Who would have thought that when we gave life to them, that 28 years later, she would give life to me? And now I carry a new kidney. I never went on dialysis. Kindness will come back to you. It will bless your life. You just have to be like God, whose loving kindness is better than life itself. And be a blessing to others. Seek to be a blessing and not to be blessed. And when you do that, God will bless your life. That young girl is... Uh, Working as a general contractor. She was our business administrator for the church before she went out and started working for the government as a general contractor, bringing in some big money. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And no developmental challenges. The other girl is this one right here. Listen. Before... The world was formed. I knew you. He knew them. 
It doesn't matter what their parents were. God knew them. And he chose them before the foundation of this earth. Come on, are you hearing me? See, it is not how you start. It's how you finish. And acts of kindness will always come back and bless your life. Now, look at Brittany. They thought she would have developmental difficulties. Black girl, is, she's naturally gifted to do what she does. She said Jackie was taking piano lessons. I, me and her were sitting watching my wife take these piano lessons in the studio. And then we went home, and she must have been about four, four years old, and came home, clammed up on the, on the, on the pedestal at the, at the piano, and started playing what she heard her mother play at that studio. She just picked it up. We said, wow, we better invest in this girl. <laughs> That's what we did. And so we decided, hey, look, we're sending her to piano lessons now so that she can not only play by ear, but she can play by reading music and all that. And then we sent her, paid extra money because we were not a D.C. resident, but we sent her to Duke Ellington. School of the Performing Arts. Amen? So that she could, what were we doing? We were trying to develop her and bless her. And I told her, because she can sing too, and she wanted to, Duke Ellington wanted to be a singer. And I told her, I said, look, you will always be blessed if you can play that keyboard. And she said, okay, Dad. And she became a proficient keyboard player. What the devil meant for evil. God turned it all around because of one act of kindness. And my wife, right here, the wife of my youth, 52 years, 52 years, 52 years, not only did I get a kidney from the one, but God then, she had clots in her lungs, both lungs, since 2009. Had to be on oxygen and riding around in the wheelchairs and all these things. Come on. She didn't like doing that. But God, she had open heart surgery last year mm -hmm. in August. And it went into her heart, through her pulmonary artery, went down into both her lungs and sucked out all mm -hmm. the clots. Mm -hmm. God has healed us. Amen. Given us a new lease on life just like he did for Rahab, mm -hmm. all because we have lived a life of showing kindness to others. Would you give God some praise? <laughs> give God some praise. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes because God is a rewarder. And so while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around, I don't know who you are, where you are in your life. But I do know God gave me this message. And I know it may not be for everyone, but it is for someone. Someone here today. Your life, in your own estimation, has not measured up to all that you have wanted it to do. Life. Life just gives you a bad hand. You've had challenges. You may have been depressed and discouraged in many areas. God has said today that I am to tell you that His loving kindness is better than and if you will confess him as your Lord and Savior, he will come into your life and live his life through yours. And the enemy that has come to kill, steal, and destroy you will be defeated as Jesus comes as your conqueror and liberates you from that life. The choice is yours, just like I demonstrated. You have to choose who you will lean to. 
Will you continue to just allow this life to use you and misuse you and abuse you? Or will you make a a decision today to lean on Jesus and lean into his everlasting arms? It's all a choice. Because the word says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so I want to appeal to those who may be here today who have never publicly confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If that's you, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, because I'm not here to embarrass you or to single you out, but I do want to give you this opportunity of a lifetime. You make the choice. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just lift your hand and put it down. Just lift your hand and put it down. I'm looking. Just lift your hand. No one else is looking. Just lift your hand. Did I see a hand go up? Raise it up again. If I saw, yes, I see your hand. You may put it down. You may put it down. And now, there may be someone here today that you once were living your life for Jesus. And you really just kind of drifted away. Challenges, life itself, pulled you away. And now you sense that it's time for you to come back to God. You want to rededicate your life. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand and put it down. This one person, thank you. I see your hands. Thank you. You may put it down. Anyone else? There's three people who have lifted their hand. Thank you, my brother. I see your hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, I want you to take, like, like Rahab, a step of faith. You have to stand up. You raise your hand, now stand up as a witness that God has spoken to you. Yes, go ahead and stand up. You lifted your hand, I want you to stand. And I want you to meet me at this altar because I want to pray for you right now. I want you to come, 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 come. Thank God because you just made the best decision for the rest of your life. What has been before is about to be reversed. Come on. Everything that has happened in the past is going to remain in the past. The future is bright in the name of Jesus. Now, while you're standing there, there's another group of people God told me to speak to. Someone is here today that has been sowing kindness. You've been a kind person all of your life, but you have not seen the fruit of that kindness. You have felt like life has kind of just ignored you. You've been, you've given kindness, you've blessed people, but you haven't seen it come back to you. God said to tell you, this is your due season. This is your due season. So if that's you and you've been a person who's shown kindness, but you haven't seen it come back to you, I want you to stand to your feet and come join me right here. I want to pray for you today. Come on. If that's you, I want you to come. Come on. You've been sowing kindness. You have sown kindness. And God wants you. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Now, the last group, the final group. God says, I will by my spirit place on you a spirit of kindness. You see, the best way to reach your family members, the best way to reach your friends, the best way to reach your community, your neighbors, your co-workers, is not by beating them down with the word of God. No, no. Just be kind to them. To do so, though, you got to be able to look beyond their faults. Come on, <laughs> to see their need, which means you got to have the spirit of kindness on you. You got to have God's spirit upon you. And so, if that's you today, and you want to be used by God to touch your friends, your family members, your loved ones, or the people you work with, and you want that spirit of kindness to be on you and to remain upon you. I want you to join us. Stand to your feet and come on up and join us. Well, I want to pray for you today. There is a spirit of transformation. The spirit will move from me, the acts of kindness, the heart of kindness will move from me to you in the name of Jesus. I want you to come right now. You're the one. <laughs> She's the one. Look at the back of that shirt about the rapture. Amen. So I want y'all to lift your hands right now. Lift your hands. Lift your hands to the Lord. In the name of Jesus, first and foremost, I'm going to speak to this group. And I'm going to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you've spoken to their hearts. And Lord God, they are here today to rededicate or to give their lives to you. 
from this day forth. So I pray that the spirit of revelation and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ would be their portion. That from this day forward, they will choose to serve you for the rest of their lives. And so now if you will repeat this prayer after me, I'm going to pray a prayer. You just make that prayer your prayer by repeating these words and God will hear and he will answer. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess I've not been all you expect of me. I've lived a life of sin like so many others. But today, I confess my sins. And I thank you for your forgiveness. I stand now forgiven of all my wrongdoing. My past is behind me. My future is before me. As I confess you now as my Lord and my Savior. Come into your, my life. Live your life through mine. And I give you my life from this day forward. Say in Jesus' name. Welcome to the family of God. Hallelujah. Give them a round of applause, church. Welcome to the family of God. Brother, I know some come with tears. Some come with smiles. But the good news is that they come in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family of God. We love you. You may be seated. Now, lift your hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord is here. And what He wants to give to you today is a changed heart. A heart that will no longer be a heart of stone. A heart that will always be a heart of flesh. That you will be open and your eyes will be open to see those whom God is calling into his kingdom. And through loving acts of kindness, you will bless them. And for you, my dear, who've always walked in kindness, God says, this is your due season. Get ready for the increase. Get ready for the harvest. The Lord was saying to you that I have seen you, my dear. You are mine. You have lived for me. You've loved me. And you have served me. And you have been a blessing to many. But you have not seen all that you have wanted to see in your own life. But this day, I declare to you that your harvest is now coming into the forefront. You will no longer have to wonder whether or not I have heard you, whether you, whether or not I've seen you in your good deeds. Now you're going to know that you know that you know that I've seen it, I'm blessing you in ways that are beyond your wildest expectation because I am the God who loves you and has chosen you and I want you to know that I want you to continue to love people, to forgive people, to show acts of kindness. So I'm going to bless you so that you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And now may the spirit of kindness be upon you now. In the name of Jesus. The spirit of kindness, loving kindness is coming upon your heart like never before. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God says you will love like you've never loved before. You will show acts of kindness like you've never shown before. You've been a kind person, but I'm taking you to greater heights and deeper depths, says the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God who healeth thee. I'm going to heal what has been hurting in you. I'm going to remove all wounds. And I'm going to bring you into a wholeness so that you can be me in the earth realm, showing loving kindness to others. Spirit of the living God be upon you, fresh and anew this morning as I release unto you and transfer unto you the spirit of kindness in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. Give God some praise. Stand your feet. Let's give God some praise today. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. I want you to take the hands across the aisles. Across the aisles and take the hand of the person next to you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord was saying to you this day that even as your hands are joined with one another, I have a desire to join hearts with one another. People of different color, people of different nationalities, just like Rahab was of a different nationality 
than the Israelites. But I tore down the wall. And so I'm going to use you to tear down the walls that has been perpetrated by the enemy in this community. You are going to become me in the earth realm. As Jesus tore down the wall that separated man from man, I'm going to use you because of the Christ in you to tear down the walls. And this church is going to explode as you go forth with acts of kindness and loving on people in this community. They will be drawn to the magnetism of Christ in you. For I am the Lord thy God, and I have called you for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, now, Lord God, as we leave this place, we thank you that we never leave your presence. And in your presence, there's fullness of joy and life forevermore. So we leave here carrying the life of Christ to a lost and dying world through acts of kindness. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. Have a great day.